Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market titled Breaking the Optical Glass Ceiling, a Path to Terabit Optical Networks. Today, our panel will explore the fundamental challenges and emerging candidate solutions for supporting the evolution to terabit optical networking. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS Market and our partners, Makisha Communications, Fujitsu Network Communications, and Nokia. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the IHS Market Technology Group webinar team, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us. But before we begin, I want to highlight some features that are available for you on our webinar and how you can make the most of your experience today. So the console that you're looking at is completely customizable. So this means you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console as you wish. Now at the bottom of your console are a number of application widgets. These contain additional features that are available. Uh, make sure you check these out during the webinar. I do want to mention the resource list widget, and this is where you, you are going to find additional material about today's topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session, as well as other valuable information, including a special report authored by analyst Heidi Adams. And all these materials can be accessed and downloaded right from your console, so please take advantage of these during the webinar. And we do want to make this an interactive session, so we've included a Twitter widget. You will see that at the bottom of your screen. And this means you'll be able to tweet directly from the console. And today we're using the hashtag optical networking. We will also have a live Q&A session directly after the presentation. So please remember to submit your questions or comments at any time during the webinar by using that Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And if you do encounter any technical issues during the webinar, just click on the question mark widget and you will get the answers that you need. So now let me introduce our panel. First leading our discussion is Heidi Adams. Heidi is Senior Research Director in the Transport Networks segment at IHS Market. Joining Heidi is Tom Williams. Tom is Senior Director of Marketing at Acacia Communications. We are also joined by David Gutierrez. David is Principal Solutions Architect at Fujitsu Network Communications. And rounding out our panel, we have Kyle Hollish. Kyle is Director of Product Marketing for Optical Networking at Nokia. So welcome to our panel. It's great to have you all with us today. So let's get started with our presentation. So Heidi, I will pass the controls over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Alan, and a warm, a warm welcome to everyone joining us for the webinar today. If you follow the optical networking industry, you've heard a lot about new 400 and 600 gig coherent optical solutions that are going to be hitting the market starting this year. So today, we're going to be looking at not just this, but what we can expect to see next. Are we going to see terabit wavelengths? Are we now instead perhaps reaching the boundaries of what can be achieved with coherent optical optical technology, in particular thinking about Shannon's limit on channel capacity. I'll give you a little bit of a hint. I, we can definitely expect to move towards higher speed wavelengths, but we're also going to see several new options and solutions to explore as well. So with this, this in mind, the theme of our session today is to look at the challenges of driving that next level of performance into optical networks. We're also going to explore some of the coming innovations that are going to help the industry break through what we've termed the optical glass ceiling. At the end of the session, we are saving time for questions and answers, so if you have any Q&A, as Alan mentioned, please do enter them into the Q&A widget, and uh, we will come to those at the end of the session. So with that, let's get started off by looking at some of the relevant market trends. All right, so the first, a look at the appetite for bandwidth and the growth in bandwidth demand. But from a little bit of a different perspective, we're going to look at how much the industry is actually deploying into their networks as opposed to how much consumers are trying to consume. So the chart you have in front of you is built on the amount of line-side optical equipment capacity shipped. So using telecom transceiver shipments as a proxy for bandwidth demand. Um, over the past five to six years or so, we've seen annual increases in the range of 20 to 50% per year growth. So really high levels of growth. Moving forward, we're estimating annual growth is going to continue, but we're pegging it at a slightly more conservative 25 to 35% range of year over year growth. So I'd call this somewhat of a conservative forecast, but even with the conservative forecast, by by 2021 and beyond, we're going to expect um, significant new capacity 
to be deployed into optical networks. And here by 2021, I've pegged it at over 120 petabits of new capacity going in. So the other thing you'll note on this chart is the technologies used to meet this demand and how that evolves over time. So if you look at the bars in the chart, in 2011, 10 gig was the dominant technology. By 2016, the majority of new, uh, new capacity was deployed on 100 gig ports. 2017, we saw the emergence of 200 gig capable technology. By 2021, we expect capacity deployments to be based on 200 gig and 400 gig and potentially beyond capable technology. So in short, there's a growing appetite for bandwidth and it really does set the stage for the introduction of higher and higher speed ports into optical networks. All right, so on this next chart, I want to take a look at where is all this demand coming from. So on the consumer services side, we, can we are preparing for broader adoption of video, in particular 4K video um, and additional content. Um, we're seeing that these types of services are going to drive more fiber access and deeper network investment. And we do sh expect to shift from data to video to in the future virtual reality, augmented reality is going to yet add yet another set of bandwidth intensive services to the mix. So very important driver on the consumer and video side. The second one I have here is the evolution of mobile network architectures in preparation for 5G. So here we're going to see a range of new fixed and mobile machine-to-machine um, -machine IoT applications and this is going to set the stage for another investment cycle. That's piece number two. In the third area, enterprise and digital transformation, we're seeing in the metro in particular, primary driver is this enterprise transformation, the move to introduce and leverage cloud-based services. So the result here, burgeoning demand from uh, to the data center, from the data center, between data centers. So these three things combined, driving more bandwidth. Do we believe our bandwidth demand forecast can be achieved? The answer, we believe yes. So bandwidth, demand is one thing and being able to meet that demand in a profitable manner is probably the bigger question here. So this slide captures a little bit of that discussion. I consider it capturing the essence of the industry's ongoing battle to drive down the cost of optical networks. And as a proxy for that, reducing in effect the cost per bit transported. So in here in this chart, we're mapping optical equipment revenues versus deployed line side capacity. And this is that orange curve, declining curve you see on the chart. We've observed that to date, the cost per gigabit of capacity deployed has dropped a very remarkable 30% every year um, since 2011 and actually going back to 2007. So for over a decade, we've seen this 30% year over year drop, very steady. Interesting that in 2017, we saw a drop. So going from 30% to only a 15% year over year decline last year. So the rate of incremental cost savings dropping by half and projecting forward, we're seeing this rate of decline leveling up even further. So you can see that in the chart, the orange line is what we're predicting. That red dotted line is where that 30% year over year growth should be taking us. So the net result here potentially is we've got um, network operators already faced with deployments in a very challenging environment to meet demand and to do so in a profitable manner. And the question becomes, have we done, have we reached the limits of what we can do to stay on this ideal cost curve? Or are there some new angles we need to explore to get there? So in context, the crux of our discussion today, how do you break through this emerging optical glass ceiling that's implied by Shannon's limit? With the growth in demand, we don't really have the luxury of waiting a decade for a 10x improvement in capacity, you know, the 1 to 10 to 100 gig type jump. Instead, we're starting to see more incremental gains, 100 to 200 to 400. So we've effectively gone from a 10x to a 2x jump in successive generations. But we've done this because we need to get there faster. We don't have the time to wait for the 10x jump. So question, where to from here? What are the challenges and opportunities ahead? And I'd like to hand off to our sponsors, starting off with Kyle. Kyle. All right. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, so as Heidi alluded to, we can't talk about network capacity without talking about our friend Uncle Claude. 
And uh, just a quick quick reminder, Claude Shannon was a researcher at Bell Labs in the 40s and 50s, and at the ripe age of 32, he uh, pretty much founded the entire the uh, field of information theory and ushered in the, the, the age of uh, digital communications as we know it. And I know you were promised there would be no math, but there's just a little bit of math here. Uh, you know, we talk about sh the Shannon limit, and it's actually a very simple mathematical relationship that just relates the signal to noise ratio of, of a channel, and this could be any channel, wireless, copper, optical fiber, uh, and the amount of bandwidth you have to send signals over that channel uh, to the maximum theoretical rate at which you can reliably transport data over that channel. And, and it's a very useful benchmark for any communication researchers, and particularly in the optical networking world, uh, we've had our eye on Shannon's limit uh, you know, ever, ever since really coherent came around uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, as we're getting closer and closer. But, uh, you know, if we look there at that triangle, the, the, that capacity uh, triangle, we can actually add another dimension uh, in addition to bandwidth and signal-to-noise ratio, and that's also space. So by combining, uh, the, utilizing bandwidth to the maximum degree possible, by maximizing spectral efficiency, how we can use the available spectrum and the amount of SNR we have, and the potentially expanding fiber space with multiple paths, uh, we can have a fuller picture of the capacity potential of optical networks going forward. I'm going to hand it over to uh, David at Fujitsu. Yes, good morning. David Gutierrez with uh, Fujitsu. So as we look at this path towards uh, one terabit, as Heidi mentioned, you know, there's a lot of demands going on um, for bandwidth. The demands ultimately drive access. Access ultimately then is going to uh, drive the optical network or the transport network. If you look at it from an access perspective, there's, a, there's basically a tenfold increase in access requirements, which are subsequently going to transmit uh, to what the bandwidth requirements are in the transport network. For example, you know, business ports going from 1G to 10G, uh, wireless technologies jumping from 4G to 5G technology, that's essentially going to provide a tenfold increase in access capabilities. Uh, DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, giving residents uh, uh, one gig to the home by, uh, say, 100 meg, for example. So all these different access technologies are going to drive the optical network's need to respond uh, uh, to this growing uh, bandwidth and requirements. Certainly, if you look at this chart here, as Heidi mentioned earlier, too, you know, you're not just going to take this leap from 100 gig uh, transport, which pretty much would exist today in the networks, up to one terabit, but rather there's going to be incremental steps and that's primarily driven by the different applications and the different forms in the network that, that, that those uh, wavelengths are going to take, whether it be a point-to-point, -point, typically which you associate with a data center interconnect, or a metro network, which could be a ring uh, transversing multiple hops or a mesh-type network, or getting into regional long-haul networks and, e and even subsea networks. Certainly in simple and simplistic terms, you know, the longer the distance you go, the more uh, losses you're going to have, the more uh, linear and nonlinear effects you're going to have, and that's going to degrade your ability to transmit at these higher bit rates. But basically, you know, there's a lot of challenges to get to these points, but we see here, you can see from 2018, 2019 up to 2021, certainly a point-to-point -point application is going to get to one terabit first, uh, 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 vice the other applications, but you can see these incremental jumps uh, that are going to occur. So now we'll hand it off to... I believe Tom. Tom? So during the, the, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, during the, the first nearly uh, decade of commercial coherent uh, optical interconnects, the industry has seen a, a steady improvement in power, cost, and size on the order of about 40% per year. These improvements have been driven by, primarily by increasing data rates, integrated photonics, and higher volumes. Migration of coherent technology towards shorter reach applications has been a driving force behind the increasing volumes. Coherent was initially deployed in long haul applications. It's been widely deployed in, in metro applications as well, and now we're seeing it being utilized in edge and, and access applications. Coherence is not the first technology to follow this trend. Uh, fiber optics, WDM technology, forward error correction are all examples of other technologies that were 
initially deployed in long haul applications, but today we see those other technologies being deployed inside data centers that reaches at two kilometers or even below. The industry challenge today is to, to maintain this evolution of coherent toward higher volume, shorter reach application by continuing to leverage CMOS advances, high baud rate optics, and signal processing algorithms that can support even higher data rate transmission. Well, the earlier generations of coherent were able to make significant advances simply by increasing the order modulation order. Uh, more advanced techniques are, are needed to achieve the next generation of improvements in network efficiency. As the industry looks toward coherent interfaces of a terabit and beyond, the challenge is not only to improve theoretical performance, but also to adapt that performance to a wide range of, of network configurations. Now I'll pass it back to Heidi. Heidi, you will unmute. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that, folks. So now we're going to switch over to have a look at some of the new options and solutions ahead. And I just want to kick off this section with a little bit of a context slide. You're going to hear a lot of different, uh, a lot of different techniques and innovations and technologies, but I think you can put them into one of these three major buckets. The first being, how do you actually increase the capacity, be it of the carrier of the fiber? Um, you know, what are the techniques we're doing to improve that aspect? The second aspect, I call it improving utilization or improving resource utilization. So that could be leveraging SDN techniques for planning, more efficient service placement, real-time network optimization. That third piece I'm calling optimized for the application. So how do you engineer to specific network requirements, be it for the metro, for long haul, for subsea? So just with that as a little bit of a context, I'll hand it over to David. Okay, great. Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, to get to one terabit, I've uh, put here basically this triangle highlighting some of the different ways that we can get to one terabit, which is essentially, you know, a thousand gig uh, wavelength. Uh, three of the ways are, you know, the baud rate or the symbol rate, as well as the modulation, increasing the number of bits per symbol. If you multiply those two, you essentially get what your bit rate is going to be uh, in the network. So a combina combination of that uh, modulation and the baud rate can o increase the overall bit rate towards that one terabit. So take, for example, today you've got a uh, 32 kilobaud um, uh, transmission. Today, it, it maybe you've developed a 300 gig uh, wavelength able to transmit, you know, whatever distance at that 32 kilobaud. Well, if you increase that baud rate, say, up to 96 kilobaud, well, right there you've just uh, tripled your effective bit rate up to, uh, you know, around 900, so you're getting close to that one terabit rate. Now, certainly in a combination with increasing both the, uh, the baud rate and the modulation that's going to allow for this higher overall bit rate, you certainly have to correct uh, the effects of the fiber transmission, you know, through forward air correction. So, you know, the forward air correction becomes more and more complicated necessarily as you, as you go to these higher bit rates, but a combination of this forward air correction, the increased baud rate, uh, the different modulation schemes like listed here, whether it be some uh, hybrid modulations or the typical ones that you might have heard like 64 qualm or 16 qualm are going to help introduce these stepped uh, paths towards this one terabit network. So, you know, sounds like it's easy. Just increase the FEC, uh, provide more baud, more baud modulation, and it's going to get us there, correct? Well, there's going to be trade-offs. You know, if you increase the FEC, you're going to have more latency introduced, and certainly latency is going to uh, be a problem when, you, when you've got SLAs that you've got to consider, or autonomous applications like driverless cars, for example, where you have a latency requirement that's very low, so you have to take an effect, well, how much uh, forward air correction are you, you going to introduce while balancing the effects of the latency, as well as the power consumption that you're going to introduce from this as well. You know, also, if you increase the baud rate, for example, now you've increased your channel spacing required. So if you've got, uh, for example, in a lot of long-haul networks, fixed uh, WDM channel spacing, you increase that baud rate beyond 32 kilobit to, say, 64 kilobit, how are you going to introduce that into a fixed uh, 50 gigahertz spaced uh, uh, channel uh, window that you might have there in the network? So all these different things are going to require trade-offs, and certainly, in addition to that, it's also going to require that the digital signal processors be able to handle all these different capabilities. So if you look at this slide, you know, the, the processing technology, you can see there the different uh, CMOS technologies have really moved from 
40 nanometers down to 20. Uh, 16 nanometers is what's been talked about a lot in the market for deployments today that will help us get to uh, uh, 400 gig wavelengths. But really moving beyond that into 7 nanometers is going to help in the next few years drive us towards these really high uh, baud rates, say approaching you know close to 100 uh, kilobaud, as well as providing the, power, the lower power consumption to get that, that effect necessary to subsequently approach that uh, one terabit wavelength. Now, you know, I mentioned also, too, you know, as you approach that one terabit wavelength, let's say if you're doing that at 96 kilobaud, well, now you're looking at uh, probably 100 gigahertz spaced uh, uh, channel spacing. Now, if you remember a few years ago, the drive was, was to get everybody down, you know, oh, we've got 50 gigahertz space or 37 and a half or even 25 gigahertz space. Well, now the, the play is more of a flexible grid capability, so I can adjust that bandwidth spacing uh, to accommodate these higher, bit, uh, higher baud weight wavelengths. But in doing so, you know, just simpl sim simplistically, if you go from 50 gigahertz spacing to 100 gigahertz spacing, you have it, and you go from a 100 gig wavelength to a, to a 1 terabit wavelength. Well, yes, the wavelength went up by a factor of 10x, uh, but you know, your overall capacity only went up by uh, 5x because you just reduced your <coughs> channel spacing in half. So another alternative to get into that is uh, reintroducing uh, the L band. So you know, typically in North America, we transmit in the conventional band of around you know, 1525 to 1565 uh, nanometers. But if we start reintroducing that band above it that goes all the way up to 1625 nanometers, now you, let's, you know, simplistically you've doubled that capacity. So if you start introducing one terabit wavelengths at 100 gigahertz spacing, uh, now combination of C and L band, you've effectively now the optical network can introduce a, a tenfold increase to help accommodate, you know, the access network. So that's a little bit of introduction into the C band there. I'm going to hand it off uh, to Kyle as he gets a little bit more detail to that, as well as uh, you know, his, his portion of the discussion. All right, thanks, David. Uh, so yeah, D David uh, did a good job of introducing uh, the concept of uh, expanding spectrum, and Tom talked about history of coherence. So what I'm gonna do is go through that triangle and really the three factors that go into the total capacity of a system uh, in, a, in a little bit more detail. So let's start with that bottom left corner, if you remember the triangle, and SNR, and really maximizing what we can do with the signal-to-noise ratio in the network. There's not a lot we can do to change the signal-to-noise ratio itself. There's some things with amplification and ROM and that, that we can do, but generally speaking, it's a, uh, it's a hurdle that has to be overcome. And around 10 years ago, Coherent really made a, a massive leap, right, in, in maximizing and increasing the spectral efficiency we can get out of uh, an optical network. SNR didn't change. It was really the digital signal processing uh, that changed. And uh, since then, we've seen Coherent evolve <coughs> to, uh, as Tom mentioned, higher order modulation formats, which get, get us increased spectral efficiency, but at the cost of reduced distance. And that's just because longer distance lengths uh, have uh, 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 less signal-to-noise ratio and, uh, and more impairments. And so what you see here is a typical chart that would be uh, characteristic of a DSP or some sort of coherent interface where we have uh, different modulation formats, typically different QAM formats, where at a high-order modulation you have higher capacity and lower distance, and at a lower-order modulation format like a QPSK you have longer distance and less capacity. And most DSPs that you're probably using out there in your network uh, have two or three different different modulation formats. And that's great. That's really gone a long way to increasing special efficiency and, as Heidi showed, decreasing that cost per bit. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't get to choose the lengths of the fibers in our network. They're dictated by distance and geography. And so what if you have a length that is where that red circle is? It's kind of in between two of the modulation formats that you have. That's where we get into what's called an unallocated margin problem or a quantization uh, inefficiency problem, where in order to close that link, in order for that link to work, I have to run the green modulation format. Maybe, you know, maybe it's QPSK. Um, but I have a lot of margin left. I mean, that, it's essentially that interface is capable of much more distance than, than the distance I actually have to achieve. This is leaving bandwidth on the table. It's leaving capacity on the table, and that's something we absolutely can't afford to do uh, with the demand you know, that, that we're seeing on networks. So there's a couple ways to tackle this problem. The first would just be more discrete QAM modulation formats. Let's put more squares on that line, and uh, let's have QPSK and 8QAM, 16QAM, 32QAM, 64QAM, 
that works to a degree. It places a lot of uh, demands on a DSP, and there's really limits to, to how much uh, we can do with that. There's also issues in terms of planning and, and complexity. Uh, there's another technique called time hybrid modulation, and this is really a very elegant implementation that combines in the time domain uh, a pair or more discrete modulation formats. So it would rapidly oscillate between, say, a QPSK and a 16 QAM to achieve in between distances. And this really does solve that unallocated margin problem because it gives you a lot of granularity uh, in trading off rate versus reach. The problem is it comes with a bit of a performance penalty uh, when you mix those different modulation formats. So there's a new uh, modulation format, a new signal processing technique called PCS, or probabilistic constellation shaping. This has been an active area of research uh, in the industry for a couple of years, and it really takes two things that Coherent has been aiming for to their logical conclusion, which is it gives you almost infinite granularity in trading off that rate versus reach, so no matter what distance you, you have in your network, you can absolutely maximize the spectral efficiency of it. And then secondly, uh, it has what's called shaping gain. Because of the nature of, of the signal processing algorithm, which is really entirely new, uh, it, it achieves at least a 1 dB gain over any discrete QAM format. And that's really just a benefit of this Gaussian shape that the probabilistic shaping uh, imposes on a high order constellation format like a 64 QAM. And so this really pushes spectral efficiency right up against uh, the Shannon limit. And so it's really taken that that SNR corner of the triangle uh, as far as it can possibly go. So that's PCS. Let's move on to, uh, I think it was the top of the corner of the triangle. That's, that's B or bandwidth or spectrum. And, and, and David uh, gave a nice introduction to this. Uh, the L band, you know, it's interesting. The L band was an active area of, of not just research, but, but product and deployment about almost 20 years ago, uh, back around the, the turn of the century when we were stuck in a 2.5 gig and 10 gig world and we thought, well, yeah, we just need to, we need more spectrum from our bandwidth. Uh, but the, the telecom bust combined with the rise of coherent really put L band on the back burner for a number of years. But in recent years, we've seen increasing, uh, activity and demand for L band just because of this bandwidth, uh, tidal wave that keeps coming at us. And in terms of real deployment, uh, you know, th there are pros and cons to L band. Uh, one, one of the issues is that you have to have typically a separate optical transponder, a separate interface that can be tuned to L-band uh, wavelengths. Uh, so that's, you know, that's just a supply chain uh, issue. Same thing with the rotom. You, you'd need a, a, another rotom that can switch your 96 channels of L-band channels in addition to your, your 96 channels of C-band channel. And then in the amplifier realm, uh, in terms of EDFAs, you need a separate L-band EDFA in addition to a C-band EDFA. What's nice here, though, is that they can be packaged, combined into essentially one single unified line system that contains uh, perhaps a, there are unified C and L ROM and amplifiers, and then and then uh, combined C, C and L band uh, EDFAs uh, in one package. And the the the, the devices you don't want to have to touch in the future as you upgrade your network are those uh, remote optical line amplifier sites that are out somewhere along a railroad. You can put those in day one and have a CNL band ready system, and then as your network grows, you can put in the rotom and put in the transponders to, to expand uh, into the L band. So, so that's deployable today. Just a quick glimpse into the future. I'm not going to not going to talk too much about this. Uh, there is very active research into using the S band, that's the short band, in addition to the CNL band, and we call that ultra wide band or ultra ultra wide band. And uh, this uses a technology called semicon semiconductor optical amplifiers. So it's, it's really uh, amplifying the optical signal directly in uh, a silicon structure. And this has the, the possibility of increasing, instead of 2x, actually uh, 3x, the, the available bandwidth for transmission. And what's really excellent about SOAs is that it's a single device for, for all bands. So instead of needing separate discrete uh, CNL band amplifiers that can amplify the entire 100 nanometer or more spectrum, uh, you know, potentially 300 channels, and uh, and do that all with a single device. These are still in the research phase. Their noise figure is still a little high for uh, uh, for long-haul environments, but I would expect to see these potentially in, in metro regional environments in the not too distant future. And then lastly, let's go to the, the, the bottom right corner of that of that capacity, Shannon capacity triangle, and look at M, or multiple spatial paths. So 
any provider today, if they run out of capacity in a fiber, can certainly just deploy more fibers, uh, and then, and which of course means more systems. The problem is, is that that scales linearly. You're not really saving anything. You're, you're just getting more capacity. When, when we talk about additional spatial paths in a network, it only makes sense if, if the increase in cost is far less than linear, and we're, while we're you know, doubling and tripling and quadrupling our, uh, our capacity. And that really can, is only possible with integration that uh, things like multi-core fibers uh, make possible. So as I mentioned, you can always deploy more fibers. Multi-core fibers could potentially be a lot more efficient, certainly in terms of space and weight and just the logistics of deploying cables. Uh, one of the, the interesting things, actually I'll talk about coupling efficiency next here, um, about multi-core fibers. I'll start here at the bottom, is coupling efficiencies, right, is that it's, I can be a lot denser in interfacing an optical transport system to my fibers with multi-core than I can with multiple multiple uh, multiple fibers. This actually here's an example of a dual fiber uh, cable from Corning that uses a single LC connector instead of a, a, a dual LC connector, and and so uh, that that saves you uh, half the space right there. But in terms of of integration, there's really a couple different areas of integration that can take advantage of, of multi-core. Um, Optics electronics integration, actually that, that's, that's being taken advantage of today by many vendors, actually our, our sponsor Acacia does a great job of that. Uh, but more interesting specifically to uh, multi-core and spatial integration is array integration. Now across multiple fibers and multiple systems can I have common DSPs, common lasers, common packaging, which ultimately is gonna bring down space, it's gonna bring down cost, it's gonna bring down uh, power, across uh, a system that employs uh, multiple spatial paths. So it's, when you think about spatial division multiplexing, don't just think about the fiber. It's really more about the massive integration of the optoelectronics that can keep that cost per bit uh, going down, uh, hopefully uh, faster than, than Heidi uh, predicts it will, because <laughs> I think our, our carriers need that. All right, and I will hand over to uh, Tom and Acacia. Thanks, Kyle. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the challenge of uh, addressing different types of network requirements. And to do this, we consider uh, these two network applications as, as examples. Uh, carrier, network, carrier metro networks tend to have a mesh type architecture with many rotom nodes where wavelengths are routed between uh, between central offices. And the available chat pass band in these networks is a function of three things, the channel spacing, the number of rotums passed, and the filter characteristics of those rotums. In these networks, cost and power are primary factors, like in, in most networks, so particularly uh, Metro tends to be more power sensitive than, than say, long haul, where performance might, might be more important than power. Um, and these metro networks require uh, the ability to manage traffic on a, on a more granular uh, level. So, you know, 100 gig or 200 gig is, is well suited to, uh, to these applications. They also tend to be built out over time. So a pay-as-you-grow model uh, offers significant operational efficiencies in, in these types of carrier metro networks. By contrast, if you look at a DCI edge network, uh, it's got very different characteristics. They tend to be point-to-point -point interfaces with very limited amounts of channel filtering. In a lot of cases, the network operators will build these networks out on day one. They'll build out full capacity on the on the line. So, you know, maybe 100 lambdas or, or you know whatever they plan to deploy, they deploy it all up front on day one, and they they can utilize as much capacity as the line can handle. So they don't need this fine resolution to, to be able to manage traffic at a lower level. So if you can give more capacity, it'll, they'll use more capacity. Um, purchasing decisions in, in these cases are heavily driven by cost and power. Uh, cost per bit is always the metric that, uh, that people refer to in, in these DCI type applications. Um, I also, these uh, network operators tend to be very aggressive in the tr transitioning toward open line systems, and they have shorter deployment cycles than traditional carriers. They'll, they'll replace technology, you know, maybe on a two-year 
three year type uh, type cycle compared to the longer cycles of, of carrier networks. These differences are just meant, you know, look, looking at two different network applications to to show that the the difference uh, is is not just about you know, it's not just the, the spacing, the actual characteristics of the network drive different optimizations. If you look at a long haul type network, you'll see, you know, a whole different set of uh, trade offs that need to be optimized for. Next, I want to take a look at how coherent, the latest technologies in, uh, in coherent interconnects are addressing these challenges to meet a wide range of, of characteristics. We like to think about this thermostat analogy because if, the, if you have a thermostat and you only have a, a hot and a cold setting, it becomes difficult to, to manage a comfortable temperature as you toggle between a, a cooling setting until you freeze and then you flip it to a hot, hotter setting and heat setting until, until you, you're sweating. If you implement a continuously variable control on the thermostat, then you can dial in exactly a comfortable temperature and you, you, you get rid of these large dead bands. Likewise, in a coherent solution that supports just a few modulation formats on, on integer QAM modulation modes uh, and a limited number of baud rates, you, you suck, a, as, as Kyle referred to, you has, have this, uh, this quantization error that occurs because of the, the limited number of choices. In, by shaping the uh, by shaping the, the modulation and and having the ability to adapt to non-integer settings, you can then dial in and reduce the amount of uh, unall unallocated uh, capacity that uh, that you lose by the this quantization error. In addition, by shaping the spectrum as well as the constellation, you can optim fully optimize the capacity that can be delivered across any particular channel. In a practical network, the efficiency of the transmission system is measured against the capacity limits of the available channel. So if you have excess noise margin, that means that you've got channel capacity that's been stranded and you, uh, you're unable to, to utilize that. With more, if you take all of these features uh, and you combine them with more intelligent software-defined uh, control algorithms, you can really reap the uh, full benefits of this, uh, these highly flexible coherent interfaces. So next I'd like to take a look at how DWDM networks have, have transitioned over time. Uh, we've touched on this a little bit, but I, I, I just would like to highlight um, early networks were uh, utilized fixed grid transmitters as well as line systems that had uh, fixed uh, fixed spacing. Initially, these were 100 gig spaced channels, and then the industry moved from 100 gig to 50 gig in order to double the capacity. Later, uh, flexible grid WSS technology was introduced, which made it possible to adapt the line system to different types of transmission characteristics on each wavelength. This can allow a network to support multiple generations of interconnect, interconnect technology uh, by utilizing that utilize different transmission spectra. For example, a channel passband might be set differently for 10 gig or 40 gig or 100 gig transmission. The optical interconnect technology deployed during this generation typically supported few baud rates and modulation formats though. Many network operators are moved away from full flexible grid technology because they prefer to keep the channel spacing fixed in their network. It avoids the, the risk of stranded spectrum where you have two channels that may be separated by a small amount, uh, but not enough to actually fit another channel in between. So if you have a 25 gig space in between two channels, maybe that becomes stranded capacity that can't be utilized. In theory, it's possible to do a defragmentation on a network with, with that problem, but that becomes very difficult in, in practice and, and has been generally, uh, generally avoided by network operators. So these network operators prefer to, to standardize on a channel plan across the entire band. It might be a 50 gig, it might be a 75 gig, 100 gig, even 150 gig, but they use the same spacing across the entire band and that allows them to reduce that stranded capacity that might occur between, between channels. As we discussed earlier, 
the space, even though the spacing may be, uh, may be common, different applications might see different uh, actual passbands on a, on a given 75 gig spaced uh, network, you might have a different actual passband that is uh, available. And so with a flexible uh, transmission system where you can adapt the baud rate, you can then adapt the, the spectrum utilized by the transmission to the available spectrum of the network. And now, so instead of matching the network to the transmission or the interconnect technology, now you can adapt the interconnect technology to match the available passband of the network. Now I'm going to turn it back to Heidi for the next section. All right, so at this point in time, we're going to reach out to the audience and get you guys to provide a little bit of input to us in terms of what you've heard and what your thoughts are. So we've got a little survey question for you here, um, a list of different techniques. We'd like to ask you what you believe are the most important ones for enabling this next generation of optical networks, and I'd invite you to select the three that you think are going to be the most important going forward. So quickly, I'll read you through the list. Um, new modulation techniques, including constellation shaping, that's one. Um, do you expect faster symbol rates? So that move towards 100 gig, gigabod potentially and beyond, um, is that going to be key? Um, advancing and enhancing FET clock algorithms. Uh, moving towards smaller, newer CMOS design processes, i.e. this path towards 7 nanometer designs and beyond. Um, do you see more spectrum as being important? So expanding into the L band or potentially the S band moving forward. Um, maybe you believe we need to do more on the fiber itself, introducing new types of fiber to expand what we can transport on it. Um, optimizing design to application, adaptive control of wavelengths, or maybe something different. Please pick three. I'll give you three, two, one. All right, I'm going to submit this and uh, just take us a couple of seconds to get the results. Here we go. Um, very interesting. Multiple different techniques look to be of importance. So um, over half the audience, um, new modulation techniques, including constellation shaping and this concept of adaptive control of wavelengths. So those seem to be the, the top things of interest to the audience. Um, expanding into L-band also of interest to half the audience. And then this move towards um, smaller and smaller uh, CMOS uh, design processes as well pops up. So thank you so much for participating. Kind of good to, to see what you guys are thinking with respect to what's been presented. And from there, we shall move on. All right, so this next section, we're going to have a quick conversation around different deployment applications of some of this technology that we've just discussed. So I'll hand first over to David. All right, thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation about the different applications. This, again, summarizes those applications. Uh, you can see, but what I also wanted to highlight was the fact that there's a lot more uh, central offices than there are data centers uh, currently. And that emergence of data centers is going to continue to drive uh, the different applications and the different innovations. For example, you know, all this different flexibility leads to lots of potential complexity, but as we try moving from provision networks to programmable networks, that's where the SDN layer or the open APIs uh, overlaying this different technologies is going to help to drive and make this a realization as we move beyond, you know, simple, excuse me, uh, simple point-to-point -point or simple provision networks into more uh, programmable type networks. I had some animation on here, and I'm struggling with this animation, so. Well, I guess, anyway, the point was just just function, just highlighting the fact that, you know, moving from more provision networks to more programmable networks is going to be one of the keys, especially as you can see here, the data center growth is going to start really taking off as you, as you try to match the amount of central offices that are out there today, uh, as you can see from this map. Now I'll pass it on to uh, Kyle. All right, thanks, David. So I just want to take a look at the at the system level, what this might look look like combining uh, all these different techniques to increase capacity. So I think it's fairly safe to say we've we've discussed this throughout the webinar that in a couple generations we're likely to see terabit wavelengths. So uh, look at one of these squares on this grid as as a terabit wavelength. Uh, but that means we're going to need flows in networks of ten terabits, and we're going to need petabit systems 
in order to keep up with all this, you know, specifically DCI demand. So what might that look like in a combination of, uh, of, of maximizing SNR and spectrum and space? And so we're going to see these massively parallel systems. So let's just take an example of a 10 terabit super channel and what that might look like. Well, one application is a spectral super channel, and this is pretty much what we deploy today, or what, what, is, what, is, what is commonly deployed, where you're tightly spacing multiple channels uh, together you know, in, in a point-to-point in a -point fashion to, uh, uh, to achieve a large single flow. But in a network where we have multiple spatial paths available, it actually might make more sense to do a spatial super channel. And what this is is the same wavelength across multiple, multiple cores or multiple fibers, and uh, there are definitely certain benefits to this uh, in a green field or a, or a sub C application. I'm not going to go into details, just to show you that that's kind of an option. Uh, and then we might have uh, an example of a hybrid super channel that combines both a spectral super channel and a spatial, spatial super channel. Uh, the point is, is that we'll have multiple options uh, to achieve high bandwidth uh, between data centers. And it's going to use a combination of maximizing spectral efficiency with things like PCS, using spectrum, and using, uh, using space. So I will uh, hand this over to Tom. Thanks, Kyle. Leveraging features of modern coherent interconnect technology combined with advanced network tools, further advances in network utilization are also possible. Today's coherent implementations offer advanced performance monitoring that can allow network controllers to predict network vulnerability and take act action. Real-time optimization tools can minimize implementation and practical applications, and as we discussed earlier, flexible modulation, baud rate, and capacity features allow for smaller trade-offs that can eliminate excess margin guard band. Network operators are investing in SDN and artificial intelligence so they can take full, full advantage of the flexible, flexibility enabled by modern coherent interconnect technology. But it's gonna take time to achieve the full benefits. Initially, configuration details are likely to be optimized on a network operator basis where optics are optimized for some reference ca uh, channel characteristics that might be different from one network operator to another. Taking the next step, some network operators may uh, optimize the configuration at the time of deployment. And if we look further in the future, you can imagine smart networks where they monitor and adapt to optimize capacity real time to minimize uh, all margin guard bands. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Heidi. All right, thank you. So for this final section, we're just gonna each ask each of our sponsors to share a little bit with respect to what their companies are working on in this particular area. So with that, I'll start with David. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, we talk, you know, you can see all the different layers here in, in optical transmission uh, and the different advancements going on. You know, we also talked about, you know, different rotom technologies for CNL band or fixed filters, things like that. So our approach uh, with the uh, Onefinity optical networking has been to disaggregate the different layers to help uh, provide a more open and more programmable network that's ready more readily to adapt to the changes. So as you, as you make these incremental changes, uh, from 100 gig to 2 and 300 gig, 400 gig, and then on up to 1 terabit, you know, you're just changing one layer of the network while you're keeping the other layers in, in place. For example, the, uh, the layer 0 or the, the DWDM layer, and you're keeping, say, for example, your switching layer in place. You're just changing out uh, the, the transport layer or the wavelengths that are being introduced into the optical network. So the idea here is that you make this network uh, not only uh, uh, more programmable, but also more open and disaggregated so that you save you know, simplistically you save on cost and space uh, versus uh, a fixed network that combines everything together, but also it allows you to adapt uh, uh, as the networks are, are, are changing and technology is evolving. And ultimately, this gives you, you know, more revenue opportunities as you move uh, uh, along this path. Now I'll pass it on to Kyle, I believe, or excuse me, Tom. No problem. Thanks, David. At OFC in March, we demonstrated our AC1200 module, which is capable of transmitting up to 1.2 terabits per second in a form factor 40% smaller than the 5x7 modules that are available today and support 400 gig. Based on our Pico DSP, the AC1200 module utilizes 3D shaping to adapt transmission to optimize reach, capacity, and spectral efficiency 
for any channel, character, uh, channel characteristics. Combined with our enhanced TPC FEC, 3D shaping allows network operators to maximize their network utilization. AC the AC1200 also has an internal switch fabric that allows it to support up to three 400 gig Ethernet client interfaces that can be a divided that can be divided across the two 600 gig carriers. Or alternatively, for long haul applications, the switch fabric can enable a single 400 gig client interface to be split across two wavelengths of 200 gig QPSK transmission. The AC1200's combination of low power consumption and a compact form factor enables high density transmission systems that can address the growing bandwidth demands for network operators. Now I'll pass it over to Kyle. All right, thanks, Tom. So yeah, speaking of OFC, uh, Nokia at OFC this year, we announced our, actually our fourth generation DSP called the, the Photonic Service Engine 3. And really what's notable about that is it's the first DSP to implement probabilistic constellation shaping, as I discussed. And, uh, you know, I think key thing to remember is not just that infinite granularity of, uh, of rate versus reach, but really that performance gain that PCS gives you. And uh, this is, uh, you know, at least a dB or 25% performance gain versus discrete QAM and, and up potentially up to a 2 dB performance gain over the, the comparable time division hybrid QAM that a lot of uh, new DSPs are, uh, are implementing. Uh, in terms of platforms that the uh, PSC3 will be in, uh, our 1830 PSI, a new generation called the 1830 PSI-M, uh, a sled-based disaggregated uh, compact modular platform. PSD3 is actually a family of DSPs, uh, a, a lower cost, lower power, 100 gig, 200 uh, version uh, called the PSD3C, and then the PSD3 super coherent, that's the one with PCS. And so you'll be able to get both of those sleds uh, in the 1830 PSIM for that, uh, that compact modular uh, form factor. And then uh, just one other point is uh, the, the bandwidth, the spectrum side of, of the equation that, that we talked about. Uh, our 1830 PSS ultra wideband wavelength routing solution actually was announced in 2016 and has been uh, uh, very widely deployed by internet content providers uh, across the globe. And that's a complete system, amplifiers, rotoms, transponders. So really, uh, you know, doubling that, that capacity into the L band with, uh, uh, with deployed systems today. Thanks. On to Heidi. All right, so just before I wrap up, I'd like to invite the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're getting very close to the top of the hour, so probably we'll only have time for a couple of questions, but if you ask them, we will still um, have the opportunity to follow up with you by email after. So please ask away in the background. And with that, let me just wrap up uh, the session with a couple of comments. So first off, um, we heard there is demand out there. Bandwidth demand is not a Debating at all, um, you know our traditional innovation paths for for you know getting up that bandwidth curve and introducing new cost-effective technology. We're seeing more incremental gains. However, it is not the end of the story. And I think as we heard on the session today, there are a lot of new solutions, technologies, approaches coming to the table that are going to help us to increase capacity and utilization and start adapting more flexibly uh, to both applications and uh, fiber and fiber reaches that are actually in today's networks. So we're seeing lots of effort underway to bring these new innovations to market. Our three sponsors are, of course, closely involved with that. And I think we've got the makings of the path to enable the evolution to terabit optical networks and beyond. So with that, I'll wrap up the presentation part of the session. And I'd like to move over to the Q&A section. So questions for our three speakers today. I've got a few on the line. Uh, let's see what I can pull off to get us started. Um, I do want to just make one comment for the audience because there's been a couple of questions come in that maybe drive the boundary. So, you know, you've got client side optics, what's happening within the data center, the reaches two kilometers and less. Um, you know, that's sort of one evolution path and our discussion today is more for the longer reaches. So, you know, um, 40, 80, 100, 1,000, 10,000 kilometers, that's more the discussion point for coherent optics and our focus for this session today. All right. so. Um, question number one, where to start? Um, 
Uh, la, 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 la. Let's start with, well, okay, I'm going to throw a question over to Tom from Acacia and we'll see if anyone else wants to comment on that. And I hear this question a lot. It's with respect to the impact of silicon photonics. We didn't touch on it a lot in the session. Does this have a role to play in coherent transmission and is this going to be something that's also going to help drive down cost of uh, transmission? So Tom, do you want to start with that one? Uh, sure. We. Uh uh, we're certainly a question we we we'd love to answer. Obviously, we are heavily invested in silicon photonics in our uh, coherent interfaces. So we absolutely think coherent uh, silicon photonics has a place in in coherent transmission. Uh, silicon photonics fundamentally is best utilized where high levels of integration are utilized to uh, to leverage the benefits of high yielding CMOS processes. So. Uh, coherent is a complex, is inherently a complex optical component that has many devices and it leverages the benefits of silicon very well. Uh, we think long term, silicon offers lots of packaging advantages as we, you know, transition the optics in industry more toward the kind of high volume packaging technology that the electronics industry has been using for, uh, for years. So we, we think there's uh, definitely, uh, silicon photonics is proven in coherent applications, and, and there's legs for, uh, for 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 much much more development going forward. All right, thank you, Tom. All right, I'm going to fire a question over to Kyle, and it's with respect to PCS. Um, you also provide a great discussion, um, Kyle, around you know have we you know we have we are maximizing all the all the capacity we've got we've reached Shannon's limit. I guess the question is, um, you know, how do you get for, to terabit from here? You know, how close are you really to Shannon limit? Is there still a little bit more space that we can move on? Sure, sure. And I guess I have, I have to clarify because my, my researcher uh, friends will, will scold me if I say we've reached the Shannon limit. You've never really reached the Shannon limit, <laughs> but uh, you can get very, very, very close. So the question then becomes, where do you invest your research dollars, right? Uh, all, all, of us, the whole, all of us vendors have limited research dollars that we have to apply to, to different techniques. And so, um, you know, trying to get closer to the Shannon limit uh, with, you know, improvements in coding and how we utilize SNR is perhaps not the best avenue anymore. And so I think it really goes to uh, decreasing that cost. So things like higher, higher baud rates, higher single carrier rates like a terabit, even though they're not more spectrally efficient, do have advantages. There's, there's fewer lasers, fewer modulators, fewer components, you know, better, better power consumption. So I think that's definitely a path that, uh, that we'll continue to pursue. And then also just, you know, expand, expanding spectrum uh, and, and space and increasing overall system capacity. All right, cool. I've got a question for, for all of you guys. And we heard a lot today about getting more and more granularity. So having, you know, filling in the gaps between the different stops that we have today with, you know, currently available modulation schemes and what have you. So really getting at more efficiency and better usage. My question to you guys then is, you know, what are the tools that we're going to need to be able to actually implement that into networks from a management perspective? So I did hear someone mention, um, you know, there could potentially be some fragmentation. Um, you know, there's other potential issues. If you have all these incremental steps, how do you manage it? What's required? Would any of you guys like to take a grab at that? I, I guess okay, I can very simply. And, and <laughs> Go for it, Kyle. <laughs> I'll answer it. <laughs> I'll say really simply, it's just a, a close, a clo you know, you need, you need a closed loop, right, between you need uh, telemetry and instrumentation uh, from the network itself, typically from the DSP. The DSP has the best visibility into uh, the, the health uh, and the capacity of that wavelength. And I, I think if, if that telemetry and those interfaces are open, then you've, you've, you've got potentially an entire ecosystem of SDN controllers and, uh, and optimizers that can then, you know, perform this potentially rather complex management function. Yeah, and I was also there. just going to say, this is David, you know, with these DSP technologies, instead of just doing static uh, network uh, planning and then provisioning, you know, now the DSP is interacting with the SDN controller so that you can constantly be monitoring the health of the network, adapting the network, 
uh, again, making it more programmable so that uh, now it functions better and, and provides more revenue opportunities, but also opportunities here to introduce these um, uh, higher rates uh, by just, you know, uh, providing full end-of-life fixed programmable, or excuse me, fixed uh, provision networks uh, that are designed for all variances from the start. Now you can have this more programmability functions. And also, I was just going to say too, you know, this, uh, you know, somebody asked a question about the seven nanometer uh, uh, technology. Certainly, yeah, that's driving uh, all this programmability and functions uh, that are going to be capable here uh, as we drive towards one terabit networks, as well as also introducing, you know, more optics, uh, pluggable optics. Uh, certainly, uh, on the client side, that's pretty much uh, uh, all it is today. But then also optics on the network side that are. Uh, um, uh, DCOs and ACOs, so like CFP2 DCOs are coming on the market uh, today, things like that. Uh, so that's all being driven also too by uh, uh, DSP technology. All right, I've got one last question for all three of you, and you got like two seconds to answer it, and it's actually a great question, a great way to wrap it up. So, you know, everyone's touched on new generations, DSP, new DSP capabilities. So do you guys believe that these next, these new generation DSPs are going to help us get back on that cost decline curve? And is that going to help save us a little bit on the cost of deploying 100 gig and beyond? I think well, I've I hope they don't everybody. get too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that's Nokia's answer. <laughs> uh, Tom, comment on that, David. Sure, sure. I, I, I can say, you know, I, I think I question, you know, whether it's a, a, a true change in the in the cost curve or, or just a little bit of a breather driven by other market dynamics, but I, I think we see that there is still a, a path to continue along the, the kind of uh, advances that uh, we've seen over the last, say, seven or eight years. All right, yeah, excellent. And, you know, again, if you just look at the, the, uh, the demand and then that's driving, again, the access networks and those access networks and access points and, and uh, are going to drive what, what we have to do in the optical or the, the, the main part of the net network, that's all going to drive us to, uh, to those points as well. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the audience for, for being with us today. Thank you to our sponsors and speakers. So with that, we'll wrap up today's session. We didn't get to answer all the questions, but we will do some follow-up by email. And uh, with that, thank you very much for attending. Handing back over to Ellen. Thanks, Heidi. I want to thank everyone as well for being on our webinar today and for submitting all of your questions and comments. I do want to thank Heidi for leading our discussion, as well as Tom from Acacia, David from Fujitsu, and Kyle from Nokia for this uh, very engaging discussion. So an archived version of this webinar will be made available shortly, so feel free to come back, view this session again, or even share it with your colleagues. You are going to see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of the webinar, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And lastly, make sure you follow us on Twitter for information on future IHS Market Technology Group webinars. So again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.